Ghostbusters, Providence, Rhode Island, Monday, March 3rd, 2014. It was a quiet afternoon in the local public library. There was a good share of people in there reading and studying, and in that library worked a woman named Allison. She was pushing her cart full of books, putting everything back in place. Later, she goes down to the basement. The basement was kind of quiet and kind of eerie. As she was putting away books, she had felt something, something unusual. Unknown to her, behind her, the books began floating off the shelf and rearranging themselves. She turned to look, but there was nothing going on. Allison knew about the history of the library, the history of a local librarian by the name of Eleanor Twitty. She was a librarian there from the late 19th century to the earliest 20th century, and there are many stories of people witnessing her ghost in the basement. But Allison was the kind of woman who didn't believe in such a thing. And as Allison was walking by the old drawers of cards from the long since disused card catalog system, unbeknownst to her behind her, the drawers began opening themselves and the cards began flying out. Allison, hearing the sound of the cards flapping, turns around and sees that all the drawers were opening and all the cards were flying out. Allison got scared and began running. As she rounded the corner, suddenly she was confronted by a monstrous entity that was screaming at her. Later that afternoon at the University of Rhode Island at the Psychology Building, there was a office marked Paranormal Psychology Research, and it had three names on the door, Dr. Peter Venkman, Dr. Raymond Stance, and Dr. Egon Spangler. And on the glass of the door was written, Burn in Hell, Venkman. Someone was obviously angry at Peter Venkman. Inside the office... It looked more like a giant storage closet. You have shelves full of bizarre gadgets and just laying around were other giant pieces of machinery whose purpose was unknown. And there you saw three desks and in front was uh, another table. And there in that table were sitting two students and behind the table was Peter Venkman, a tall, thin, lanky man of 35 with straight brown hair and blue eyes and he was sitting there holding up zener cards cards that had symbols of a square star and wavy lines he was holding up the backside and seeing if the two test subjects could guess with accuracy what card he was holding up it was a test on ESP ability, but his test was a little different. He was doing a test called negative reinforcement on ESP ability. Basically, the two test subjects, a young man and a young woman, were tied to a machine that was going to give them electric shocks, mild ones, of course, if they got the wrong answer. And of course, Peter Venkman, being a ladies' man, was sparing the attractive young woman the shocks and shocking the heck out of the, the poor young male student. The poor young male student finally had enough and rips off the electrodes and told Dr. Vakeman he'd keep the five bucks. He was going to pay them for the participation in the experiments, a measly five dollars. Then Vakeman looks at the young female student and he says to her, well, you're going to have to get used to that kind of resentment. That's the kind of resentment your gift is going to bring to you when people find out about your abilities. Of course, Dr. Vakeman was lying. And he says to her, well, I have an idea. Let's explore this further. And then he was about to say something when suddenly Dr. Raymond Stance storms into their office. Dr. Raymond Stance was a man of 33, tall, freckles, blue eyes, and red hair. 
He heads over to the shelf and looks into one of the makeshift drawers and he asks Pete aloud, Hey Pete, where's the memory card for the camera, the one we erased yesterday? And then Peter gets up from his chair and walks over to Ray and slaps Ray in the head saying, I'm in the middle of something, Ray. And then Ray says to Peter, listen to me, Peter. Today at 1.40 p.m. at the Providence Public Library main branch, several people saw a free-floating torso apparition. It blew books off the shelves, and it scared the socks off one old librarian. And then Peter says, well, that's great. You and Egon look into it. And Ray says, no, Peter, you're coming with us on this one. You have to. And then... Peter says, I'm here with a test subject. Of course, Ray looks at the test subject and he says, sure, test subject. And then he says to Peter, come on, Peter, grab the camera with the infrared lenses. Afterward, Peter walks over to the young woman and he says, well, you can come back tonight and we could explore this further. And then he was going to say that she interrupts him around eight. And then Peter says, my God. God, I was just going to say that. You are a legit phenomenon. She lets out a giggle. Later, Peter and Ray were walking up the steps of the public library. And Peter says to Ray, You know, Ray, you have been interviewing every nut job and schizo in this state. And then Ray says, Listen, I have a feeling that this may be a legitimate ghost, he says to Peter. Well, as they were in the library, Peter sees Egon with a stethoscope, and the stethoscope was pressed against a table, and Peter decided to have a little fun with Egon by slamming the book on the table near the stethoscope, and Egon quickly jumps up and yanks off the stethoscope. He turns to see who did that, and it was Peter, and he says, oh, it's you, Peter. Egon was a man of 32 tall, slightly chubby, with thinning brown hair. And Peter asks Egon if he heard anything, and Egon says no. The manager of the library walks up to the three men, and he says, I take it you men are from the university. And Peter says, yes, we are. And the manager asks him if they were going to be able to solve this. And Peter says, well, we don't know what you have yet, sir. And then, moments later, they were interviewing poor Allison. She was sitting at one of the tables sipping her tea with a shawl wrapped around her and she was telling the guys what she saw saying it had arms and legs it was all purple and it looked like a rotting corpse it was flying after me i was running as fast as i could then peter sits down across from allison he asks allison to give her one of her hands and allison gives peter her left hand peter takes her left hand puts his index and middle finger on the vein to feel her pulse and then tells Allison to look into his eyes. Peter was doing physical lie detection and he begins asking Allison a battery of questions. Asking, so Allison, are you currently or have you ever experimented or abused any psychedelic drugs? Allison says no. Then Peter asks her the next question. Do you have a history or does anyone in your family have a history of mental illness? Allison says, no, I've never known myself to be mentally ill, but I do have an uncle who thought he was St. Jerome. And then Peter says, well, that's a big yes. And then he asks the next question, Allison, are you currently taking any medications? And Allison says, yes, I'm taking two, a blood pressure medicine and a cholesterol medicine. And then she names the medications that she's taking, and Peter ruled it out as he knew that those medications had no side effect of hallucinations. Then Peter asked the final question, a very personal question. He asked, Allison, are you currently menstruating? And then the manager says to Peter, what does that have to do with anything? And then Peter says to the manager, back off, man. I'm a scientist. Then Egon comes over holding a bizarre device and he's saying, guys, it's moving. So they were following Egon who had a bizarre device in his hand. It was a 
metallic device that had a TFT display screen and on top it had two red wings with yellow LEDs at the ends of it. The LEDs were flickering at a normal flicker speed as they were walking around. They were walking around the basement where Allison saw the ghost. As they were walking around, suddenly they saw several giant stacks of books and then Ray says look at that symmetrical book stacking just like that one case at the New York Public Library back in 1909 and then the skeptical Peter says yes no normal human could stack books that high then the three guys rounded the corner and see the card catalog all the drawers were out the cards were all over the place and dripping from the open drawers were a bizarre slimy substance with the same color and viscosity of human nasal mucus and then Ray says with excitement, oh my goodness, ectoplasmic residue, actual physical contact with the supernatural world. Then Egon quickly pulls out a Petri dish collector and gives it to Peter. And he says, Peter, I want a sample, collect some. And then Peter opens the dish and begins to collect the dripping slime. And as he was doing it, he says aloud, great Egon, somebody sneezes and you want to collect their snot. As Peter was collecting the ectoplasmic residue in the Petri cup, he got some on his hands. He's like, ah, gross, ah. And he began wiping his hands on the books and on the cards. And then he quickly catches up to the others and he gives Egon the Petri cup saying, here you go, Egon, your mucus. After Peter said that, suddenly a bookshelf behind them falls, scaring all three of them. Peter turns to look at Ray and he asks Ray, happened to you before? And Ray nodded his head no. The three men continued on walking and the device that Egon had, the wings, began to raise up and the LED lights began to flicker faster and it was making a noise. Egon says to the two guys behind him, the PKE meter's picking up something. This way. The three men round the corner and out in the opening, they saw it. A ghostly apparition that had a purple glow to her. She looked like she was an elderly woman and she was wearing turn of the century clothing from over a hundred years ago. The three men were in shock and awe and Ray quickly grabs the camera hanging around his neck and begins snapping photos. Then Peter asked both of the guys, is this the first time that any of you have seen this? And Ray says, yes. And Aegon says, yes, definitely. Then Peter asked both of them, what are we going to do? And both men stood silent looking at each other. Then Peter grabs both of the guys by the ears and drags them back around the corner saying, come here, Francine. And then we could hear clearly from behind the bookshelf, Ray saying, okay, I think one of us should try to make contact with it. Peter, you do it. Peter was not pleased that he was tasked. So Peter comes back around from the bookshelf and he asked the ghost librarian, so is that something interesting you're reading? And the ghost librarian says, shh. And then Peter asked the librarian, so where were you from originally? And she says, shh. Then Peter goes back around the corner and he says to both of the guys, all right, fellas, this is not working. And then we could hear Ray's voice behind the corner saying, okay, I got an idea. And a count of three, let's grab her. And then the three men come around the corner again, walking quietly, ready to ambush the ghost. And then Ray counts down one, two, three. And then the three men run after the ghost. Suddenly, the ghost turns into a scary-looking spectral monster and lets out a loud demonic scream. The three men quickly run back the opposite direction, running as fast as their legs could carry them. They go flying out of the library, running at high speed, with the manager right behind them asking, Hey, what's going on? Did you see it? How did it look like? A few minutes later, the three men were walking down the street quietly with 
Peter razzing Ray, saying, that was a great idea, Ray, let's go get her. And then Ray says, hey, I was excited, I was caught up in the moment, I didn't know what to do. And Egon says to the two guys, well, I would say our encounter was not in vain. According to my PKE readings, if all spirits are negatively charged, like that one was, maybe we could use positive energy to trap it and hold it indefinitely. And then Ray says, wow, that's brilliant. We could bust some serious heads, in a spiritual sense, of course. And then Peter asks Egon, you're really serious about this, aren't you? And then Egon says, I'm always serious. And then Peter's like, huh, wow. So we could actually capture ghosts with positive energy. And Egon says, as soon as we get back to university, I could run these findings through my computer and compare it with the previous findings from the PKE and see if it's all consistent, he says to the two guys. Later at the university, the three men arrived and they see Dean Yeager, the dean of the college, and several moving men. And Ray says, I trust you're moving us to better quarters. No, fellas, you're being moved off campus, he says. And he goes on to say to the three men, your grant has been terminated and the university shutting down its parapsychology research project. And then... Peter says to Dean Yeager, you can't do this to us, the kids love us. Dean Yeager was visibly not liking what Peter said and he says, I'm sorry fellas, we believe that science is meant to serve mankind. You three treat science like it's a dodge, a hustle. Your theories are the worst kind of trite and in the 10 years that we've been financing this project, you three have produced nothing conclusive. And then the two guys turn to Peter and Ray says quietly, I thought you floored them at the Regents meeting. And then Peter says to Ray, well, they laughed at my jokes. Later outside at the campus courtyard, Ray was pacing back and forth while Peter was sitting on the stone wall and Ray says I can't believe this happened to us he was drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels as he took a swig and then he says forget MIT and Stanford now they wouldn't touch us with a 10 foot cattle prod and then Peter says oh Ray you're always worried about your reputation and then Ray says to Peter, well, we had it made here at the university. We had a roof overhead. We had funding. We didn't have to produce nothing substantial. I've been out in the private sector. They expect results. And Peter tries to calm Ray down saying, hey, look, Einstein wrote his best stuff when he was a patent clerk. We'll make it. And then he goes on to ask Ray, so for this idea that you and Egon have about capturing ghosts with positive energy, you think it's possible? And Ray says, yes, it's possible, but to do this, we need a huge load of capital. I mean, money with a capital M. The next day, the three men leave a local bank with Ray in shock, and he says to Peter, I can't believe you didn't bargain with the guy. The 19% interest is going to eat us alive. In order to start their business, Ray had to take out a business mortgage at 19%, and since he was the only one that had a house to put up for collateral, he had to take one for the team, which upset him. As he says to Peter, my mom left me that house. And Peter says, you're not going to lose the house, Ray. You're going to be fine. Then Egon's cell phone went off, and Egon pulls out a cell phone. He saw it was an email, and then he looked at his email and says, guys, check your email. I just got approval for that research grant we applied for the other two guys pulled out their cell phone and sure enough they got the confirmation email as all three of them had individually applied for research grants and they all got it this now added more capital for their startup the next day the guys were looking at an old firehouse with a real estate agent she was a couple years older than them and says to them so you guys like the place and then egon says to her well there's serious metal fatigue on the load bearings the electrical wiring is substandard for our power needs and the neighborhood does not look like a safe place to be out at night then ray from the top of the fireman pole in the second floor screams, Hey, does this thing still work? And then he slides down the pole and acting like a little kid, 
on Christmas says, wow, this place is great. We got to stay here the night, get a feel for the place. And then he says to them, I'm going to get my stuff out the car. Whatever bargaining trick the two other guys had went out the window and the real estate agent looked at both of the guys with that smile on her face like she had them. And then Peter says to her, we'll take it. A week later, at a very nice, expensive high-rise apartment building in Providence, the name of the building was called the Burnside Apartments. It was a very luxurious apartment that served mainly middle to upper class people. It was built in the early 1920s in the neoclassical style. And on the top of the building, it had what looked like an ancient Roman temple on top. Well, a young woman was pushing her cart full of groceries to the entrance, and the doorman let her in. Her name was Dana Barrett. She was a very slender woman with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. And as she gets off the elevator, she tries to sneak past one apartment, and sure enough, a short, bald man comes out, and he says, Oh, hey, Dana, it's you. I thought it was the pharmacy. I was waiting for them to deliver me something. And Dana asks the man, Oh, Lewis, are you sick? And Lewis says, no, I was just ordering some vitamins. My doctor says I should start taking vitamins. Lewis was a 35-year-old man who was a very well-to-do accountant. And he had a massive crush on Dana. And it was always evident. And then he walks with Dana down the hall to the end of the hall where her apartment was. And then as Dana was unlocking the door, Lewis says to her, Oh, one more thing before I forget, Dana. You shouldn't leave your television on so loud when you leave. And then Dana looked puzzled. Like, I thought I turned off the TV. And Lewis says, yeah, but the creep down the hall phoned the manager, and then I tried to get out on the ledge to try to disconnect the cable, but that almost ended very badly. So I turned up my TV to make it seem like both of us had the same problems with our TV since both of us have Samsung. Then Lewis goes on to invite Dana to his party Thursday night, and then Dana says, well, thanks, Lewis, and then closes the door in his face, and Lewis says, okay, I'm just gonna go have a shower. He walks back over to his apartment to find out he locked himself out again. Inside her apartment, Dana sees that her TV was on, but the volume was normal, and there was a commercial on for the Ghostbusters. She pauses a moment, looks at the commercial. She found it quite unusual, and she remembered the phone number on the screen, then she turned off the TV. She takes the groceries to the kitchen and begins to unload the groceries. She puts her carton of eggs on the counter right next to a bag of Stay Puff marshmallows. As she was putting away everything, suddenly we see that the carton of eggs opens by themselves, and the eggs inside start jiggling. Then one egg bursts and the yolk gets on the countertop, followed by another egg and another. And as the egg yolks were on the countertop, suddenly they began frying on the countertop. Dana, who was busy putting away everything, heard the sizzling and smelled the smell of frying eggs. She turns to look at the direction where the sound was coming from and she saw the eggs were frying on the countertop. She was frightened by what she saw, then she heard a bizarre growling coming from the refrigerator. She cautiously walks to the refrigerator and opens the refrigerator, and instead of seeing the normal inside of a refrigerator, she saw a giant void, a dimension of some sort, and there at that center of that dimensional void, she saw what looked like a temple-like structure, and there there was some demonic-looking dog that screamed the word Zul to her. Dana slams the refrigerator door shut and runs out. A few days later, in front of the old firehouse, the Ghostbusters had managed to clean up the old firehouse. A bunch of men were putting up a very plain looking sign that said Ghostbusters. It's all they could do on their limited budget. And Peter asked the guys putting up the sign, You think anyone's going to see this from the roadway? And then Peter hears the sound of a very sickly sounding car coming towards the firehouse. He turns to look and he sees an old 80s Cadillac Fleetwood hearse that had one yellow light on, the yellow light that meant that the procession was going on, and the old beat up hearse pulls right in front of the firehouse entrance. (laughs) 
Peter screams at the driver of the car, Hey, you can't park that here! And then the door opens, and Ray steps out and says, Okay, everyone, we can breathe. I found a car. And then Peter looks at the beat-up hearse. It was a black 1984 Cadillac Fleetwood hearse with a red roof. And the paint job was really in bad shape as there were a lot of big patches of gray. And then Ray goes on to say, well, she needs some work. I mean, she needs... Well, as you could hear, the engine needs fixing, new rings, new pistons, brakes, shocks, suspension, exhaust. And then Peter asks Ray, how much did you pay for this? And Ray says, 10 grand. And Peter rolled his eyes back. The next day at the firehouse, Peter was coming in and he was asking their new secretary, Janine, a plain young woman about their age, wearing thick glasses and black hair tied back in a tight bun and peter asks her any messages janine and she says no dr vankman and then he asks janine and he calls and she says no dr vankman and he says to her fun job isn't it and then he says to janine rather tersely don't look at me with those bug eyes and type something will ya we're paying for this stuff and then as peter was heading to the back of the office area he briefly pauses and looks back at Janine. He's like, I'm sorry for the bug eyes comment, Janine. Uh, then he goes back into the office area. After he goes back into the office area, Janine pushes her chair back, and from underneath the desk emerges Egon. And Egon says to Janine, Well, the printer's dead. Thank goodness this thing's still under warranty, he says to her. And Janine says to Egon, You're pretty handy with electronics. Do you have any hobbies? My hobbies are racquetball and reading books. And then Egon says, My hobbies are usually collecting things. Right now, I'm currently collecting spores, moles, and funguses. Egon's answer was kind of off-putting to the flirtatious Janine. Moments later, Dana, wearing a heavy overcoat, comes through the front door of the Ghostbusters business. As she was walking by the completely dismantled Cadillac Fleetwood hearse, it was completely in pieces. The engine was outside, stripped down to its block, and Ray was working underneath the hood. Ray lifts his head out of the hood of the car as Dana was walking by calling out for anyone in the firehouse. Hello, is there anyone home? Hello? Then she walks up to Janine's desk and introduces herself saying, Hello, I'm looking for a Ghostbusters. I don't have an appointment. Of course, Peter in the back office area, just hearing a woman's voice, quickly gets up, sees her, and runs up to Janine's desk and introduces himself saying, Hi, I'm Dr. Peter Venkman. I'm a Ghostbuster. Later, upstairs in the firehouse, we see a computer monitor with an image of Dana talking. It looked like she was in thermal vision on the monitor. There was a specialized camera pointing at her, and she was connected to a lie detector machine. And Peter asks Egon, so is she telling the truth? And Egon turns off the machine and disconnects Dana Frank. He says to Peter, yeah, she's telling the truth all right. And Peter says to Dana, that's pretty weird. You usually don't see that kind of a behavior in any normal household appliance. And Egon explains his theory, saying, well, it could be race memory stored in the collective subconscious. And Ray says, well, it could be past lives intruding on the present. And then Dana says to the two of them, I'm sorry, fellas, I don't believe in none of that stuff. And Peter says to her, well, I don't believe in none of that either. Ray says, well, I'll go down to public records and see about that building. Maybe the building has a history of psychic turbulence. And Egon says, I'll look up the name Zul in our usual literature. Ray says to Egon, Tobin Spirit Guy? And Egon says, also check out Spate's catalog. And Peter says, well, then I'll take Dana back to her apartment and check her out. I mean, check out her apartment, he says. Later, Dana opens the door to her apartment, and Peter steps in front of her, saying, If anything's going to happen, let it happen to me. 
He goes into the apartment. He had a bizarre device that collects air samples. He was pumping the bulb, sucking in air. He was checking out every nook and cranny of the apartment and he heads towards Dana's bedroom and Dana says that's the bedroom nothing ever happens in there and then Peter says to her what a crime and then visibly irritated Dana says Dr. Vankman you've come all this way would you please check out the kitchen well Peter goes into the kitchen and the air was filled with the foul smell of rotting eggs from the eggs that were rotting away for days on the countertop. And then Peter begins taking samples from the air around the egg. And then Peter goes to the refrigerator. He cautiously opens it. And then he opens it all the way. The refrigerator was normal. And Dana upsets like, no, 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 no. Dang it. There was a freaking bizarre world. Some sort of temple. And a giant horned monster that screamed Zool. And then Peter takes an air sample from the refrigerator and he says, well, I don't doubt you, but right now everything looks normal. And Dana says, great, either I'm losing it or I imagine the whole thing. And then Peter closes the refrigerator saying, no, you didn't imagine it. You were telling the truth. And let's just say when we get nothing but nut jobs coming day in and day out, you're pretty genuine. The two of them head back to Dana's living room where Peter decides to hit on Dana by confessing that he was in love with her. But Dana was having none of it and threw him out of her apartment. Later that night, the three guys were eating dinner. They were eating Chinese and Peter says to the guys, hey, I'm going to need the last of the petty cash to take out this client. I don't want to lose her. And then Ray says, well... This magnificent feast here represents the last of the petty cash. As the guys were eating their dinner upstairs, the phone rings downstairs and Janine answer it, saying, Ghostbusters, she grabs a pen and pad and she says, Yes, yes, of course, they'll be totally discreet. What's the address? She writes everything down and she says, Don't worry, sir, they'll be over very shortly. Then she hangs up the phone and with excitement she screams, We got one! And then she hits the bell. Hearing the bell, the guys quit eating and they quickly got up and ran to the poles and slid down the poles. They run to their lockers, open it up, and put on their khaki color flight suit. Soon, the front garage door of the firehouse opens wide and the fully restored and modified hearse, now christened Ecto-1 as is seen by the front license plate, the car starts up and the sirens blare as it speeds out of the firehouse. Ecto-1 pulls up in the old Biltmore Hotel, one of the oldest hotels in Providence, Rhode Island. Well, as the Ghostbusters come in fully decked in their flight suit, proton packs, and Ray has a bizarre goggle on his head, Peter shouts, Ghostbusters, has anyone seen a ghost here? Then the hotel manager comes from behind the Ghostbusters, frightening them, and he says to them, Gentlemen, I hope you can handle this quietly. And then Ray says, Oh, we handle everything quietly. And then Peter asks, So what's going on? And then the hotel manager says, Well, there's a disturbance going on on the 12th floor. I mean, this hotel has always had these disturbances for decades. But they always have been minor. Maybe one or two people scared. But tonight, this is pretty bad. Whatever it is, frightened a lot of people out of their rooms. The Ghostbusters reassured the manager that they were going to handle this. They go towards the elevator where there was a man waiting for the elevator. He asked him, You fell some kind of cosmonaut? And then Peter says to the man, No, we're exterminators. Somebody saw a roach up in 12. And then the man says to Peter, and that must be some kind of roach. And Peter says, bite your head off, man. Then the elevator opens. The Ghostbusters go inside, and Ray asks the man if he was coming aboard. And the man says to them, Nah, I'll take the next one, fellas. Thanks. 
Then inside the elevator, Ray says to the rest of the guys, you know, it just occurred to me, fellas, that we haven't had a really successful test with this equipment. And then Peter says, well, we're going to find out if it works tonight or not. And then Ray says to Egon, Egon, switch me on. And then Egon, who was behind the other two guys in the elevator, presses the red LED start button on top of Ray's proton pack. <laughs> The elevator opens on the 12th floor, and the three guys step out the elevator. Egon pulls out the particle throw and starts the proton pack from the particle thrower. As the three guys were walking cautiously down the hall, Peter, of course, didn't have his proton pack on or his particle thrower out. As the guys rounded a corner, they hear a squeaking wheel from a cleaning cart, thinking it was the ghost they were looking for. Ray and Egon quickly turn around and fire a blast from their particle throwers. The stream of protons hit the cleaning cart, destroying a lot of the contents and causing a small explosion. The cleaning lady had quickly ducked behind the cart for cover, and Peter has stopped Ray and Egon from blasting any further. And the cleaning lady screamed at them, What the heck are you guys doing? Ray says, We're sorry, ma'am. We thought you were somebody we were looking for. And then Peter says, Successful test, guys. And then Ray says, I have an idea. Let's split up. And Peter says, That's a good idea. We could do more damage that way. And the guys split into different directions. Peter went one direction, Ray went the other direction, and Egon went another direction armed with his PKE meter. Egon was scouring the halls with his PKE meter, and he was picking up traces of where the ghostly specter had been. While Ray had found the ghostly specter, a giant green globbly ghost that was eating food like there was no tomorrow from a food tray in the hallway. Shocked, Ray went back around the corner, and he grabs his radio, and he says, Guys, come in! Guys, come in! There was no answer, and then he says aloud to himself, Looks like I'm gonna have to subdue him myself. Then Ray grabs a particle thrower, and then leaps back out from around the corner, and takes a blast at the green ghost. <laughs> Of course, Ray misses the ghost and leaves a very bad streaking burn mark across the wall where the proton stream hit. The green ghost begins flying and the food cart follows right behind him. The green ghost goes through the wall, but the food cart was not spectral, so it crashed into the wall with a mighty sound. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the other end of the 12th floor, Peter was walking around, and he saw the green ghost come right in front of him. He grabs his radio, and he says, Come in, Ray. Come in, Ray. And Ray says, Yeah, Peter, I read you loud and clear. And Peter says on the radio, Ray, I found our ghost. And Ray says, Excellent. And then he goes on to say to Peter over the radio, He's an ugly little spud, isn't he? And then Peter says to Ray on the radio, Ray, I think he heard you. Then the ghost lets out a scream and flies towards Peter. Peter screams into the radio, and then Ray runs towards the direction of the scream. He arrived and he sees Peter covered in green slime, laying on the floor, anchored down by the heavy proton pack. And Peter says to Ray, Oh God, he slimed me. And then Ray says with his childlike enthusiasm, This is great! Physical contact with the spirit world! Then Egon comes over the radio asking, Guys, what's going on? I hear some screaming. And then Ray gets on the radio enthusiastically telling Egon, Egon, Peter's been slimed! And then Egon says on the radio, Wow, that's excellent. Save a sample for me. And he goes on to say on the radio, The ghost just flew into a ballroom downstairs. Well, later, downstairs, the Ghostbusters were entering the ballroom with Ray saying to the manager, Don't worry, we will have this taken care of before the dinner starts. And then Ray closes the door to the ballroom. Inside, the guys were searching and Ray had the goggles over his eyes. And he sees the specter flying around a chandelier on the ceiling. 
Peter sees the specter and says, that's the one, that's the one that slimed me. Then Egon says, guys, before we start going after this thing, I have to warn you about the proton packs. Whatever you do, do not cross the streams. And then Peter asks, what happens if we cross the streams? And then Egon says, simple particle physics. The particle throw is thrown out proton streams at high speed if two protons come in contact and collide with each other in high speed the collisions will generate a gamma ray burst that'll kill all of us peter says to egon thanks for the important safety tip then they pull out their particle throwers and start taking blasts at the green ghost the green ghost was over at the main table eating and drinking everything of course since he has no stomach everything that he ate and drank came out chewed from his bottom half onto the ground leaving a very gross scene as egon was trying to shoot at it the ghost got hit but he was not wrangled in the proton stream he goes flying across the room from getting hit by the proton stream of course the proton stream emanated from egon's particle thrower was destroying everything on the table the food and even caused the cake to explode peter says to egon nice shooting tex and then the green ghost was hovering midair and ray says okay that last shot took energy out of him and he says i'm gonna drop the ghost trap and of course every ghostbuster had a ghost trap wrapped around the proton pack ray pulls out his and slides it on the ground right beneath the green ghost who was just hovering midair panting like a dog then Ray says, okay, Peter, I want a confinement stream from you. And Peter takes a shot at the green ghost and the proton stream wraps around the green ghost. And then Ray says, okay, Egon, I need one from you. And Egon fires at the green ghost and the proton stream from his proton pack wraps around the green ghost. And Ray says to the guys, okay, start lowering him. And when I give the signal, I'm going to tell you to look away when I open the trap because the light's going to be so bright it could be blinding. And then as the guys were lowering the green ghost, then Ray says, okay, three, two, one. Then he hits the foot pedal and sure enough, the lid of the ghost trap opens up and a very bright beam of positive electromagnetic energy shoots up from it. The other two Ghostbusters deactivate their proton stream and quickly look away from it. And of course, the green ghost was sucked into the ghost trap and as soon as he was sucked in, the ghost trap shuts. The three guys looked at the ghost trap. The ghost trap's LED lights were blinking, indicating that they captured the spirit. Uh, then the Ghostbusters emerged from the ballroom. Ray was holding the smoking trap like it was a dead rodent of some sort. Uh, then the manager asked, so did he get it? How many of them were there? And Ray says, well, sir, what you had in there was a class five free floating vapor or a real slimer as i like to call it and then peter comes up with a pad that had the bill on it and a pen and he says to the manager all right now time to talk business now for the entrapment of the creature that's going to be five hundred dollars we also going to charge five hundred for equipment maintenance and one hundred dollars for our salaries and another hundred dollars for the general bills and then the manager's like what twelve hundred dollars if i knew it was going to be this expensive i would not call you guys i'm not going to pay it then Peter says, okay, then we can let the ghost we just captured back into your ballroom. And then he turns to Ray and he's like, can we, Ray? And then Ray says, sure, Peter, we can. And then the manager's like, okay, okay, I'll pay the bill. Then Peter pulls the bill from the pad and gives it to the manager. And he says, thank you for calling Ghostbusters. Then the guys leave the hotel with Ray screaming, look out, coming through with a class five. Soon the Ghostbusters business was taking off, as now they were getting calls constantly, day and night. It seemed that everybody and their mom 
was seeing ghosts in the tri-state area. It had gotten so busy that they needed to hire a fourth member. Plus, they were starting to make a lot of money now, so they could afford to hire a fourth member. Enter Winston Zeddemore, a 34-year-old black man who had just moved to Providence, Rhode Island to be closer to his family. He was standing in front of the Ghostbusters HQ, holding up a printout of the ad he saw on the internet, which said, Looking for a strong, able-bodied individual for the job of... Being a Ghostbuster, must be able to carry 25 pounds on your back, and must be able to drive and have a safe driving record. If interested, come to this address. Well, moments later, Winston was being interviewed by Janine, and she was asking him a battery of questions. And then he says to her, well, if there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe in anything you want. And then Janine says, okay, and then the... Ecto-1 pulls up and Peter and Ray come out. Both of them look like they've seen better days as they were very tired. With Peter saying to Ray, you know, Ray, you don't look fully dead. You look half dead. And then Ray says, thank you, Peter. The bags under your eyes today are not as bad as you were yesterday. And Peter says, thank you, Ray. And then Ray was holding two steaming ghost traps. And then Winston gets up and Janine gets up. And Janine says... Dr. Vankman, Dr. Stance, this is Mr. Winston Zeddemore. He's here for the job. And then Ray looks at Winston. He says, beautiful, you're hired. Welcome aboard. And then he gives the happy but yet surprised Winston the steaming ghost traps. Later that day, Dana was coming out of the Performance Arts Center with the rest of the orchestra, saying to her male violinist friend, I don't know where they get these guest conductors from. It does them no good to scream at us in German. And then her male violinist friend says, One day I would like to have a German composer who doesn't go off the edge if he play one minor sour note during a Beethoven piece. As Dana was talking to her friend, she sees Peter, who was right in the distance by the water fountain, goofing around. She tells her friend, excuse me, and then she comes over to Peter, and she says, My Dr. Venkman, I thought you guys had forgotten about me since you guys had gotten so famous. And then Peter's like, oh no, we haven't forgotten about you, it's, that's just it, we've gotten so busy. Then Peter reaches into his coat pocket and pulls out a folded paper. It was a printout from an online encyclopedia. And he says to Dana, I have the information here on Zool. And then he begins to read out loud from the printout. Zool was a minion of Kakia, believed to be a demigod, but often debated as being a high-powered spirit. And then Dana asks Peter, who's Kakia? And then Peter says, according to this, Kakia was the Greek goddess of evil in the Greco-Roman pantheon. And Dana asks Peter, then what is she doing in my icebox? And then Peter says, well, I don't know. But let's say we talk this over in dinner, say Thursday night this week. And then Dana says, I can't, I'm busy. And then Peter's like, oh, come on, it's just one date. I promise, just one date. Then Dana smiles like, okay, one date, Thursday night. And then Peter sees Dana's violinist friend using nasal spray and he asks her so who's the stiff and dana says to peter he's one of the most talented violinists there is and peter says oh really then dana says well excuse me dr vinkman i have to go and then she walks away and then of course peter says goodbye to her and tells her violinist friend you sir i'm sorry i didn't get to meet you but you're looking very clear you need to use more of that nasal spray Later at the basement of the firehouse, Ray was giving instructions to Winston on how to empty the ghost trap. They were standing in front of a big device that was fire engine red. It had a red and green light, several buttons, and a lot of warning stickers. Two of them that stood out to Winston was a warning about a high-powered laser and another warning about high-powered magnets. And then Ray opens the receptacle and he gives Winston the instructions. He says, you put the trap in here and you press the release button. As he did that, the trap battery separated from the cassette and then he closed up the receptacle and then he presses the red button saying to Winston so you press your entry grid and then Ray presses a yellow button saying then you press the neutronizing field 
And then Ray pulls on the big lever saying, then you pull on your lever. And then a sound that echoed within the wall sounded almost like a prison door closing. Then the green light comes on and Ray says to Winston, the light is green, the trap is clean. Then he pulls out the trap from the receptacle. And then he says to Winston, and the battery pack for the trap, you set this on the recharge pile. And then Winston grabs the second ghost trap that had to be empty, and he asks Ray, can I try it? And Ray says, sure. Winston does it, and he does it perfectly. Meanwhile, upstairs, Peter was coming from giving Dana the information when Janine says to Peter, Dr. Venkman, you have a visitor here. His name is Walter Peck. He says he's with the EPA. And then Peter's like, okay. And then Peter quickly asked Janine before he went to meet the EPA man, so any luck on finding a secretary for the night shift? And Janine says, no, we have a lot of promising people, but, you know, people are kind of scared to work here, you know, with the reputation of you guys busting ghosts. And then Peter says to Janine, it's understandable. And then Peter goes to the office area, and then Walter Peck gets up and introduces himself. Hello, I'm Walter Peck. I'm with the EPA. Walter Peck was a man near 40 with brown hair. He was tall. Him and Peter shake hands, and of course, Peter's hand still had some ectoplasmic residue that Walter looked at and was kind of grossed out and he says to Walter sorry then Peter asks Walter so how are things going down in your branch of the EPA and Walter says fine it's going very fine and then Peter asks Walter so what brings you over here and then Walter Peck says well I came here to investigate your day-to-day -day activities he says to Peter and then he asked Peter so Dr. Venkman what are you exactly a doctor of and Peter says well I have doctorates in both psychology and parapsychology and then Walter says to Peter and now you bust ghosts and Peter says yes and then Walter asked Peter where do you keep these captured spirits and then Peter says we keep him in our state-of-the-art magnetic containment system and then Walter asks Peter, do you keep your containment unit on these premises? And Peter says, yes. And then Walter asks, may I see this containment system? And Peter says to Walter, you didn't say the magic word. And then Walter let out a slight smile, like, may I please see the containment system? And Peter says, no. And then Walter gets a little angry and he says, Dr. Venkman, I have to see that unit. And then Peter asks, why do you have to see our containment system? Then Walter says sternly, well, frankly, there's been a lot of talk on the news about your operations. And we have to assess if there's any noxious chemicals that's hazardous to people. And then Peter's like, no. And I can assure you there are no noxious chemicals or anything toxic at all being used in our operations. And then Walter says, says to Peter, okay, fine, have it your way, Dr. Venkman. I'm going to come back with a court order. And Peter says to Walter, fine, you do that, and I will sue your behind for wrongful prosecution. Meanwhile, back downstairs in the basement where the containment unit was at, Ray and Winston were connecting the recharged batteries to the emptied out ghost trap cassettes while Egon was looking at his laptop with worry in his face and then Ray asks, hey Egon, what's going on? You look like you're worried. And then Egon says to Ray and Winston, well, it's just this morning's report on the state of the containment unit. And Egon goes on to explain to the guys, the containment unit is trying to get very crowded in there. It's about to exceed its capacity of what it could hold. And Ray asks Egon, how bad is it? And then Egon grabs a Twinkie from the table and says to the guys, imagine that this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the city of Providence. According to today's reading, this Twinkie would be 35 foot long and 600 pounds. And Ray says, holy crap! And Winston says, wow, that's one big Twinkie. And Ray says, my goodness, we could have a PKE surge of dangerous proportions. And Egon says to Ray, you're right, we have to find a way to either expand the capacity of the containment unit or find a place to build a bigger one. 
Later that evening, at Dana's apartment building, a violent storm was brewing overhead as lightning was crashing everywhere. The sun was beginning to set, and as the storm was intensifying, at the very top of the apartment building in the temple section, we see two stone gargoyles. Both of them look just like the demonic being that Dana saw in her refrigerator, and suddenly... A creaking and cracking noise was heard coming from the statues. Soon at the foot of the statues, the foot of the statue burst and a pair of monstrous paws emerge and the eye area of the statue begins to crumble revealing a red glow coming from there. Something was coming to life, something evil. Dana was getting off the elevator as she could hear the loud music from Lewis's party. She tried to sneak by and of course Lewis came out. He tried to convince her to come but she told him that she had a date tonight. He was upset but then Lewis swallowed his pride and told Dana that she could come and bring her date anyways. Dana smiled and she says, okay Lewis, we'll try to stop by after the date. And then of course Lewis locked himself out. Dana, tired from a busy day, goes into her apartment. She sits down, pulls out her smartphone, and begins to do some texting. Then she heard a bizarre growl coming from the kitchen area. She looks at the closed door of the kitchen and sees a pink light emanating from the edges of the closed door. And she saw some sort of monstrous figure whose shape was moving on the door as if the door was made of cloth. Dana was about to say a profanity when all of a sudden a pair of monstrous hands emerged from the chair that she was sitting on. They grab and hold her and the door of the kitchen opens. You see the bright pink light and you see the monster there letting out a loud growl. Soon, the chair was being pulled towards the open door as Dana let out a muffled scream. As she was taken into the glowing kitchen, the door violently slammed shut by itself. Then, we go to Lewis's apartment. Lewis was having fun at his party, and his guests were mostly clients, as he was talking about this and that. A pair of guests had arrived, and he introduced them. He took their coats and threw it into his bedroom. Unbeknownst to him, there was a monster in that bedroom. Then he heard the growl, and Lewis says aloud, Okay, who brought the dog? Suddenly, there was an explosion as that monster went leaping out of Lewis's bedroom, shattering the door and the surrounding wall, and hitting the wall across the apartment. Lewis fled from his own apartment as he was waiting for the elevator. The elevator had opened at the nick of time as that monster came busting through the door of his apartment. Well, Lewis eventually fled from the building, screaming that someone brought a bear to the party. The doorman and a few people trying to get into the apartment were wondering what he was talking about. Suddenly, that monster came running out of the building, knocking down everybody. As Lewis ran as fast as his legs could carry him, he found a restaurant. He goes up to the window and pounds, screaming for help, but everyone just ignored him. And then Lewis turns around and sees that monster. He tried to be nice to the monster, offering it a milk bone, since it resembles some giant demonic dog. Well, the monster let out a growl, and it got Lewis. Later, Peter arrives to the front entrance of the high-rise, and he sees the police everywhere. He asked the doorman what happened, and the doorman said, Some bozo brought a cougar to the party, and it went crazy. And Peter's like, huh, that's something you don't see every day. And then he goes into the high-rise, takes the elevator, and he walks by the destroyed front entrance to Lewis's apartment. The party guests were still there giving their statements to the police. And then Peter knocks on the door of Dana's apartment. And suddenly, Dana opens the door. But Peter noticed something was different about her. She was wearing a kind of dress that was very unusual for her to wear. Her makeup was heavy, and she spoke with a sensual voice, saying to him, Are you the key master? Peter, thinking it was some sort of kinky game, said no. And then she slams the door in his face. 
Peter knocks on the door again, and she answers the door again, acting like she doesn't recognize Peter. And she asks him again with that sensual voice, Are you the key master? And Peter says, I was sent by the key master. And then she lets him in. As Peter goes into Dana's apartment, he noticed something was amiss. It was covered in etoplasmic residue all over the place. And he saw the glowing light coming from the kitchen. And then Peter asks Dana, so, who are you and what you're planning? And then the possessed Dana says, I am Zul, and me and the Key Master are preparing the way for Kakia to come to this world. And Peter says, oh, okay. And then he knew that Dana was possessed by Zul, so his flirtatious, playful demeanor changed to a serious scientific one. And he says, okay, so you guys are planning the coming of Kakia. And then Peter asks Zul, so Zul, I need to speak to my friend Dana. Is she in there? And then Zul says, no, she is not. Then Peter was able to convince Zul to lay down on the couch. And then Peter, trying to use a little psychology, says, Okay, in the count of three, I want to talk to Dana. And then a monstrous voice emerged from Dana, saying that there was no Dana, only Zul. Peter was unfazed, and he said, That's a lovely singing voice. Then he said to Zul, All right, Zul, in the count of three, I want to speak to Dana. He does the countdown. And the possessed Dana begins to react violently and begins to levitate. Then Peter asked her if they were still going to go out and she just let out a growl and tried to scratch him. Later at Ghostbusters HQ, a police van pulls up and a police officer steps out of the van. He knocks on the door and... Janine answers the door and she asks the policeman, picking up or dropping off? The policeman says, dropping off. And she says, give me a moment. She shuts the door and moments later, Egon comes out and he asks the policeman, yes, can I help you with something, officer? And then the police officer says, well, we found this guy wandering around causing trouble and and, well, I'm kind of scared to take him to the mental hospital, and I really don't want to take him to county, and I know you guys are uh, <clears throat> into this kind of stuff, so we wonder if you want him. So the policeman opens the back of the police van, and sure enough, there was a handcuffed, possessed Lewis, and Egon pulls out his PKE meter, and the PKE meter starts reacting to Lewis. <laughs> And Egon says to the policeman, bring him inside. And then Janine says to Egon, Egon, it's so nice of you to take in that homeless man. And then Egon says to Janine, Janine, I don't think he's human. Moments later, at the firehouse lab, Lewis was hooked up to a lot of machinery. And Egon was asking him, so you're saying your name is Vince Clortho? And the possessed Lewis answers, yes, I am Vince Clortho. Key Master to Kakia, and she will come to this world in a pre-chosen form. And then Egon allows him to explain further, as he says, When Kakia judged the Voldranai, she took on the form of a large moving Torg. And during the Metrepicant supplication, she took on the form of a giant slore. And many Shevs and Zuls knew how it was to roast in the depth of a slore that day, I could tell you. And Janine asks Egon with a very low tone of voice, Is this guy for real? And Egon, responding back with a low tone of voice, says to her, Yes, I'm afraid he is very real, and this is what frightens me. Soon, the upstairs telephone rings, frightening both of them, and Egon picks it up, and it was Peter, and Peter explains to Egon his dilemma, saying that he had to give over 3,000 cc's of Sorazine to the possessed Dana, and then Egon says to Peter, well, I have the key master here, and Peter says over the phone, oh, that's great, now we can get them together, and Egon says to Peter, Peter, that would be an extraordinarily bad idea, you get back to the firehouse, and I'm going to try to run some more tests on the key master. Meanwhile, outside the old Ghostbusters firehouse, Walter Peck had arrived with a policeman, an employee from the electric company, and a paralegal who was giving him the warrant to shut down the Ghostbusters containment unit. Well, he enters the firehouse with the 
electric company employee and the policeman and Janine tried to stop him and said to him that he needed a warrant and he showed Janine the warrant then he made his way down to the basement where Egon was trying to run some more tests on the key master and Janine said to Egon that she tried to stop him. Egon confronts Peck and Peck just warned Egon that he had a warrant and Egon warned him if he shut down the containment unit it'll be like dropping an atom bomb on the city. And of course Walter Peck didn't care and he was ordering the power company tech to shut down the containment grid. At that moment Peter had come down to the basement and Walter Peck had reminded Peter that he had his opportunity to play nice but he thought it funny to insult him and belittle him. Well, the power company tech was a little nervous and unsure about the setup down the basement, saying to Peck, I've never seen any of this before. And Peck said to the young man, I don't care what you think, shut it all down. Though the young power company tech went to the first switch he saw and pulled the switch soon the basement went dark the red light began to flicker and a loud alarm sounded A loud noise was heard coming from the wall. It sounded like a jet engine starting. Egon screams, oh dear God in heaven. And he screams again, okay, everyone, clear the building. And everyone ran up the stairs as the walls started blowing up. Soon as everyone left the firehouse, there was a massive explosion. And from the roof of the firehouse, it looked like a volcanic eruption. All the spirits that the Ghostbusters captured were now loose, let out, and and a massive explosion of PKE energy shooting up into the sky. While everyone was outside, the key master screams, This is it! This is a sign! Janine saying aloud too, Yeah, this is a sign, alright? The sign, we're going out of business. Soon, Ecto-1 pulls up, and Ray and Winston come out running, and Ray asking the guys, What happened? And then Egon says, The EPA just shut down our containment unit. And Ray's like, Oh, God! And then Winston asks Ray, Is that bad? And Ray says to Winston, Yes, very bad. And then Peter says, Hey guys, where's the key master? Egon says, Oh no, we gotta find the key master. And Ray was like, What? Who's the key master? But before they could go and look for him, Walter Peck comes with the policemen and more police and screams at the Ghostbuster saying, Captain, these men are responsible for the explosion. Egon says, your mother, and tries to attack Peck. Soon a scuffle forms, but the Ghostbusters were arrested. And as the Ghostbusters were being arrested, all the released spirits began wreaking havoc in the city. Later in jail, the Ghostbusters were sitting in a holding cell with other arrested people. Well, Ray and Egon were sitting at a table, and they had the blueprints for Dana's apartment building. With Ray saying that the apartment was built with unusual materials like cold bolted steel girders with cores of pure selenium. And Egon said that the root cap of the building is made of a material that NASA uses to detect dead pulsars in space. And Peter says, well, so they don't build them like they used to. And Ray says, no, they never built them like this. And then Egon says that the building was built by an architect named Evo Shandor, who was a surgeon by trade, who did a lot of unnecessary surgeries and uh, medical experiments, and came to the United States in the late 1800s, started a architectural firm, and then after World War I, he thought humanity was too sick to survive, so he decided to start a secret cult that worshipped the Greek goddess of evil named Cactus. And this building is a result of it. It's a giant superconducting antenna to pull in psychic turbulence. And Ray says to Egon, we gotta see the mayor. And Winston reminded them that going to the mayor with an outlandish story like that would probably get them locked up permanently. And then a guard says... Ghostbusters, the mayor wants to see you guys. The whole city is going crazy. Soon the Ghostbusters see the mayor and also prove that Walter Peck was the idiot that shut down the containment grid and caused the explosion and all the havoc that was going on. Well, the Ghostbusters won, Peck was discredited, and now they were free to face this great evil that was coming to our world, Kakia.
While the Ghostbusters were in jail, then trying to convince the mayor about what was going on, the key master made his way back to the apartment building and finds Dana, the gatekeeper. The two of them kiss passionately and head up a secret stair case that was in Dana's kitchen that was hidden now revealed by the destruction of her apartment from the spirits who were freed from the containment unit who all flew to the apartment building being drawn to it. Later, the Ecto-1 pulls up to the front of the building as the Ghostbusters get out and grab their proton packs, strap it on, and head in. As they were heading in, they had noticed ominous storm clouds covering the city. Something evil was coming, and the Ghostbusters really had to stop it. Well... Since the power was out in the building, the Ghostbusters were forced to take the stairs all the way to the 22nd floor. By the time they got up there, they were tired and they were ready to pass out. They made it to the end of the hall to Dana's ruined apartment. They looked around and they saw the stairwell. Well, as the Ghostbusters went up the stairwell, they ended up at the top of the apartment building where the giant temple-like monolith was. And there they saw... Lewis and Dana, who were now in the process of using their power to open the great golden door that would act as the doorway into the spirit world to let Kakia in. As the door opened, soon Lewis and Dana turned into their terror dog forms and ran into the dimensional gateway. There, the Ghostbusters saw a Greek temple-like structure floating in the void and glass doors. Soon the glass doors of the temple opened up and a light began emanating from it. That light took on the form of a beautiful slender woman with piked up black hair, snow white skin, demonic red eyes, and wearing a bizarre cat suit made out of a bubbling web-like fabric. Ray says, wow, she is bizarrely beautiful. And all the guys acknowledged, and Peter's like, yeah, Ray, go get her. Of course, that meant Ray had to go and confront her. So Ray cautiously walks up the stairs and asks her to leave our world, and Kakia asks him with a bizarre voice, Are you a god? Of course, Ray answered no, and she said die, and she tried to zap him with energy. They almost were flown off the roof, but they were able to hang on. As the Ghostbusters pulled themselves up, Winston says angrily to Ray, the next time someone asks you if you're God, you say yes! Well, then Peter says to the guys, okay, this chick is toast. Then the guys took out the particle thrower, activated the proton packs from the particle throwers, Turned off the safety, and Peter says to the guys, All right, fellas, this show is prehistoric. You know what, how we do things downtown. The Ghostbusters take a shot at her, but she leaps in the air and does a flip and lands behind them. And then they turn around. Egon shouts, Aim for a flat top. It's conducting energy. Well, they did, and she vanished. Ray says, Huh, we neutronized it. Egon pulls out his PKE meter, and the PKE meter was going crazy, and he says, Guys, I don't think we stopped her. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. As quick as it started, the earthquake had stopped. And the Ghostbusters heard a thunderous voice coming from the stormy skies. It was the voice of Kakia saying to them, Foul creatures, Kakia, the Destroyer, Volga Throhadar, the Traveler, has come. Choose a form and perish. Of course, the Ghostbusters were puzzled on what she said, and then Peter quickly figured out if they think of J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover will come down and kill them. And they had to clear their heads of anything that she could use to turn into to kill them, and it was too late. Ray screwed up, and as the Ghostbusters confronted Ray on what he thought of, they saw what he thought of materialize. It was giant, fluffy, and white, and it was heading right towards the building. Thanks to Ray, Kakia had taken on the form of the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man, and she was heading right towards the building. Well, the Ghostbusters try to zap the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man with their 
proton packs, but all it did was cause them to catch fire and make them really angry, and the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man began to scale the building where the Ghostbusters were at. Well, the Ghostbusters quickly take cover from the flames of the Marshmallow Man, with Peter sarcastically saying, Hey, we got this Mr. Stave Puffed all wrong. He's a sailor. He's in Providence. We get this guy laid? We're good. And then Egon had the idea to get the gates of Kakia's temple in the spirit world to swing parallel to stop the flow of energy. And the only way to do that was to cross the streams. Peter reminded Egon that the crossing the streams were bad, and Egon says it's the only way, and then there's a slim chance of survival. Well, the Ghostbusters began to fire the proton streams into the temple of the spirit world. And as they were bringing the streams together, of course, being positively charged energy, the streams were repelling each other. But with all their strength, the Ghostbusters were able to bring the streams together. And sure enough, there was a nuclear explosion. But the most destructive part of the explosion was contained within the spirit world and the Ghostbusters leapt out the way as a powerful fireball destroyed the Marshmallow Man and the top several floors of the high rise. Molten Marshmallow rained on everybody below that had gathered to watch the Ghostbusters do battle and the Ghostbusters emerged victorious, covered in Molten Marshmallow. Dana and Lewis were back to normal, and the dark skies had cleared, revealing that it was morning and the sun was rising. It was going to be a beautiful day after all, said Winston. And then the Ghostbusters made their way down with Dana and Lewis, and when they emerged from the front of the apartment building, a crowd cheered them. The Ghostbusters were now heroes. They had saved the world from a great evil that was going to destroy it. And it was going to be the start of a long and fruitful career. Or was it? Like and subscribe. The end.